Is artificial intelligence more artificial than intelligent? And what does the term artificial intelligence really mean? Will artificial intelligence replace drivers, programmers, and attorneys in future years? How can high school teachers and college professors tell if AI applications such as SnapGPT or Google's Bard have written a student's essay? What are the proper uses of AI in Wikipedia and research and which is more useful? For companies adopting AI, should profitability trump customer service? Will it ever be possible for AI robots with zero comprehension from saying stupid, insensitive, or grossly inaccurate stuff? How can an AI engine dependably detect garbage in its input? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The end of our talk will discuss the sources used for this video. Our blog contains internet and book links and footnotes, and our PowerPoint script uploaded to SlideShare contains the illustrations and internet and book links. The author of a recent Atlantic article who is not a programmer, but who has all these impressive journalistic credentials, claims that computers have learned how to write code with a subhead. In the age of AI, computer science is no longer the safe major. As a programmer, I know this is totally ludicrous, but AI programming tools are just that, tools. What's clearly happening now is that AI is the buzzword. Every web-based program is claiming that their latest product implements AI because it's the latest sexy thing. Now, what is artificial intelligence? The original definition by Alan Turing is that a program is deemed artificially intelligent if the user conversing by keyboard is convinced that a live human being is responding. But keep in mind that artificially intelligent programs have zero comprehension. Although they can do quite well on intelligence tests, answering questions instantaneously, they are incapable of original thought. However, computers excel at pattern matching, and the latest AI programs can replicate text from existing text samples. Now, the program does not comprehend the meaning of these text samples, which means that it has trouble evaluating their credibility. Thus, the generated output is often what programmers call GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Admittedly, there are both impressive and problematic artificially intelligent applications. Highly accurate grammar checkers have been available for decades. Although the current application Grammarly is not 100% accurate, I find it highly useful and accurate enough. Although the current application Grammarly is not 100% accurate, even when a grammar checker flags a phrase that's technically correct, I find that often I can reword the entire sentence to increase its clarity. Even more impressive are the programs that translate from one language to another. They perform nearly flawlessly with most sentences. Less impressive are the dictation programs. When I broke my finger and was forced to try the Microsoft Word dictation programs, I was less than impressed. The program especially bungles ancient Greek and Roman names, hearing ordinary words instead. Now, admittedly, recording your dictation and having a computer program translate the audio file is much more accurate as can be seen by the generated transcripts for YouTube videos. Then there are the impressive but worrisome artificial intelligence applications, such as fully automated robotic automobiles that have no empathy for people they run over when they encounter unusual situations, or totally normal situations that for some odd reason the robot thinks is abnormal. Dr. Wikipedia has a good discussion of the problems surrounding driverless cars, pointing out that there are industry-defined levels of automation. Now we'll discuss why AI cannot write computer programs. Recently, a non-programmer award-winning journalist opines in Atlantic, ChatGPT and other chatbots can do more than compose full essays in an instant. They can also write lines of code in any number of programming languages. You can't just type, make me a video game into ChatGPT and get something that's playable on the other end. But many programmers have now developed rudimentary smartphone apps coded by AI. I'm skeptical of that. And the ultimate irony, software engineers helped create AI, and now they are the American workers who think it will have the biggest impact on their livelihoods, according to a new survey from Pew Research Center. So much for learning to code. Now, the reality is that computers have been generating code snippets for decades. In fact, Microsoft had to generate code for base Windows applications to wean programmers from the far easier to code non-graphic DOS applications. Not only for decades has their programming environments like Visual Basic and many other languages generate hundreds of lines of code for whatever type of shell application you like, but also when you start writing your program, 
An intelligent code generation program, IntelliSense, suggests what programming objects are available when you type the separating dot, but you need to know enough what they mean so you know what to pick. Our author continues, coders are now using AI to accelerate the more routine parts of their jobs, such as debugging lines of code. I don't know about that. In one study, software developers with access to GitHub's GoPilot chatbot were able to finish a coding task 56% faster than those who did it solo. In 10 years, or maybe 5, coding bots may be able to do so much more. And what was the coding task optimized in the study mentioned in this article? Microsoft ran a test. Some participants were allowed to use a chatbot-like tool specialized for programming, Copilot, to assist them in writing their code. And other participants wrote the application as they normally would. This was the task. Participants were instructed to write an HTTP server in JavaScript. And there were likely many examples of this generic code in the GitHub repository, which users voluntarily contribute to. Copilot works best for users coding in Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Ruby, and Go. Other types of more unusual programs may have far fewer examples to draw from, so the gain would be far less. Now, this is not my specialty. And so I found a Reddit discussion, GitHub Copilot, what's your experience been like? Is it worth it? Now, some programmers liked it, others did not, but nobody thought it was magic. Evidently, this tool works like IntelliSense, except that it draws suggestions from an unfiltered code base that may be flawed or just plain wrong. And you need to be a talented programmer to know the difference. Before this tool was available, programmers would just ask for help from Dr. Google or Reddit or Stack Overflow. Often someone has written similar code that you just can copy or follow to begin your project. Once you write the original version of the code, you're only 5% there. And no, in most applications, AI programs can't help you debug your code. Now, quite often, even for comparatively simple programs, you have to run the code dozens and dozens and dozens of times to find all the logical errors in your code. If you write code in a proprietary language, forget AI. People will not be as ready to share their code, which means the AI engine will have nothing to draw from. Not to mention that accounting programs and many other programs read data from a myriad of different databases assembled in a maze of relationships with field names that are unique to the business. And the SQL XML and or the JSON commands to query this data are yet more computer languages. Artificial intelligence is not magic. No computer program will ever be able to write code addressing the varied circumstances that you encounter in the real world. Human naivety is what makes artificial intelligence dangerous. Now another Atlantic article written by a real life programmer discusses the real dangers of artificial intelligence with a task that it's well suited for. Facial recognition, but it is not perfect. Facial recognition works well with white faces, but with less accuracy with black or brown faces, just due to the lack of contrast. The real nightmare of artificial intelligence is when corporate and government bureaucrats rely on artificial intelligence, even when the computer's total lack of intelligence is abundantly obvious. The author observes, a program doesn't always work as expected in the wild. In recent years, I've read with awe reports of AI systems revealing themselves to be not mythical, sentient, and unstoppable, but grounded, fragile, and fickle. A pregnant black woman, Portia Woodruff, was arrested after a false facial recognition match. She continues, Brian Russell spent years clearing his name from an algorithm's false accusation of unemployment fraud. Tammy Dobbs, an elderly woman with cerebral palsy, lost 24 hours of home care each week because of algorithmic troubles. Devone Jackson reported that he was locked out of the low-income housing his family needed to escape homelessness because of a false flag from an automated tenant screening tool. And heaven forbid if you're named Joe Smith, you'll have lots of false positives. What is also true is that many of the government systems that determine eligibility for government programs such as welfare and unemployment benefits often use programmed checklists that deny benefits for the wrong answers. And what is missing is that often there are exceptions for these questions, or the courts may not have even decided on the unique circumstances, so that yes-no answers are really not possible. And these problems are basically caused by stupid humans who do not recognize that computer programs have zero comprehension, and naively assume that they cannot make mistakes, and refuse to listen to sensible complaints. Again, this is Geigo. If the data input is garbage, the results regurgitated will also be garbage. Another problem is the deep fake problem, altering photographs to show people in places where they have never been and saying slanders they have never said, which could lead to many dirty tricks in a political campaign. 
Also, face recognition algorithms are dangerous for their false positives. China has been using facial recognition technology to monitor and control its population using a wide array of public-facing cameras. They call it Skynet. Among its many millions of faces in China, there may be hundreds or even thousands of false positives. Imagine being thrown in jail or tortured because a machine mistook you for someone else. There was a recent movie that featured drones that searched for victims using facial recognition technology. Now worse, the technology probably exists today for a drone to detect whether a face exists and target the person behind the face. What if Hamas had gotten their hands on drones like that? How much more horrifying would their slaughter near Gaza have been? The author concludes, the truth is artificial intelligence does not exist. The technology may be real, but the term itself is air. More specifically, it's the heated breath of anyone with a seat across from the people with the authority to set the rules. AI can be the enthused pitch of a marketing executive, or it can be the exhausted sigh of someone tired and perhaps confused about how minute engineering decisions could upend their entire life. No, I agree with all of the author's arguments, and I agree that AI technology is real. But the term artificial intelligence is a phrase like any other. We simply need to define it. Probably the most practical definition is also quite vague. AI is simply the sum of the most impressive recent programming achievements in pattern recognition and replication. A more accurate definition might be that everything that a computer program achieves is artificially intelligent because that is why programmers create computer programs. Now this photo reminds me of a visit to a satellite tracking station when I was a young boy scout. They had a TV on and they said, watch, you will be amazed. Then they rewound some huge reels and when they played it back, it was the same TV program being replayed. We've gone a long way. Another Atlantic article discusses how huge industrial robots and factories have occasionally killed workers in industrial accidents. And it also discusses the problems Tesla has been trying to overcome in its experimental driverless cars. Since the first known death resulting from this feature in January 2016, Tesla's autopilot has been implicated in more than 40 deaths according to official report estimates. Malfunctioning Teslas on autopilot have deviated from their advertised capabilities by misreading road markings, suddenly veering into other cars or trees, crashing into well-marked service vehicles, or ignoring red lights, stop signs, and crosswalks. We're concerned that AI-controlled robots already are moving beyond accidental killing in the name of efficiency in deciding to kill someone in order to achieve opaque and remotely controlled objectives. Is the author suggesting that Elon Musk has been ignoring the first law of robotics suggested by Isaac Asimov that robots should never injure or kill humans? Can artificial intelligence be useful for research? Personally, I view the Dr. Google search engine as a type of artificial intelligence, although it is no longer considered cutting edge or sexy as it has been around for many years. There's an alternate shell, Google Scholar, that returns many of the same results for scholarly topics but also reveals the number of citations it finds for referenced articles. Atlantic published another article by a high school teacher bemoaning how the chatbots generated text that was indistinguishable from an essay by a lazy high school student who throws something together at the last moment from Cliff Notes. Now what is the answer? Perhaps at a minimum, a teacher should request that their students write a summary of their essays after they turn them in. Also, teachers should insist on proper footnotes, something that the current generation of chatbots omit. As a test, and we included the detailed results of this test in a separate blog, we asked the November 2023 version of ChatGPT 3.5 in Google Bard several questions of increasing difficulty. We asked for essays on summary and detailed accounts of the Peloponnesian Wars, and the three or four Platonic Dialogues on love, and possible genetic and epigenetic causes for dementia. First we asked these questions without any qualifiers, then we requested essays with commentary, with sources, and with footnotes. Now what is my background? Those who graduate from college with a computer science degree are often overenthusiastic about the magic of technology. Although I have been interested in personal computers since near the beginning of the personal computer era, first buying a luggable blue K-Pro that's in the picture here, I spent the first 20 years of my career as an accountant as an early implementer of computers followed by another 20 years as a programmer of accounting systems, and my career for the next 20 years will be spent in freelance journalism. So, although I am an enthusiast of technology, this enthusiasm is tempered by practical experience and a more conservative outlook. Now, in my testing, ChatGPT did not distinguish between the qualifiers with sources and with footnotes, 
but we were pleased that Google Bard provided more complete citations, complete with publisher, publication date, and translator name when we requested an essay with footnotes. As far as the quality of the essays, both ChatGPT and Google Bard generated generally boring essays that resembled what you could expect from a procrastinating, lazy high school student. Now, we didn't spot any obvious errors in the first two simple topics, although some of the responses were terse and vague. In our opinion, the quality and content of the Google Bard essays were somewhat better. Now, surprisingly, the summary and detailed essays were not that different. As can be expected, these chatbots perform best on simple essays that might be assigned to high school students. But on the difficult question regarding dementia and genetics and epigenetics, both chatbots choked a little. What was odd about both of them was that when I requested with sources or with footnotes, both of the answers dramatically changed. What's up with that? But interestingly, ChatGPT returned more interesting sources on this more challenging topic. So in the future, these chatbots might be about even in capabilities. But I don't know enough about the topic of dementia and genetics and epigenetics yet to judge whether or not there were errors in the dementia essays. And to summarize, both ChatGPT and Google Bard performed best on simpler essays where they might be outclassed by the articles in Wikipedia. But for the more specialized topics, they fared much worse. But they can both be used to unearth more sources and double check the rough draft of your research. The accountant and scholar in me is not impressed, but the programmer in me is really impressed with this accomplishment. But I am a bit skeptical about the usefulness of the end product now and in the future. If I were a high school student, would I use ChatGPT or Bard after I wrote my first draft of my essay? Certainly, many unimaginative teachers expect the rote responses that might come out of a chatbot essay, so I might add them in just to make the essay more boringly acceptable. Personally, I would use the Google Bard chatbot with the with footnotes keywords to find additional sources to consult and to double check my conclusions, knowing that the chatbot answer may not be correct, as it is always subject to Geigo or garbage in, garbage out. Now, was ChatGPT or Bard plagiarizing its answers? Since they are basically recombining existing patterns, in a deep sense, that is all they do. But I did take some key sentences and ask Dr. Google to find them, and he could not. So these chatbots evidently do not copy, at least in the limited spot checking that I did. But I'm not sure that adding the phrases with sources or with footnotes really prompts the chatbots to truly reveal all their sources. Recently, a story popped up on the CNN YouTube channel titled, How Microsoft's AI is Messing Up the News. Now, the very stable genius is that Microsoft decided to fire the editors who selected the stories that would be featured on their MSN website, replacing them with stupid AI algorithms. The change is that there are now many fringe wacko news stories that clog up the front page, but they turned off the AI feature that was generating insensitive polling questions for disasters. Now, LinkedIn asked if I wanted to respond to this question. How do I add human advice? There are different ways to add human advice to robo-advisors, depending on your budget, resources, and target market, and they, they followed that by some unintelligible managerial technobabble. My response was, the question is misstated. It should be reframed as, how do you add robo-advice to human advice? If you have small accounts, have a dozen or so canned responses written by real human beings, and use artificially intelligent tools to make a guess as to which one applies best to the situation. And have humans monitor for at least the first few months of requests and robo-choices and refine the logic and add relevant answers. I would never allow the robot to coin advice on the fly. You just cannot predict what kind of garbage the robot will generate on occasion. Never fear, AI will never replace attorneys and many other professionals. On the YouTube channel Legal Eagle, an attorney tells us an absolutely hilarious story of an attorney who foolishly used ChatGPT to write a legal opinion. They were doubly foolish. They did not check the logic of the generated legal opinion. Generic chatbots just do not have a comprehensive database of legal opinions to draw from. So the robot literally manufactured the case law, providing fake case citations. I'm a little skeptical of that, but that's what the video said. Now, the judge was not pleased. Quite likely, the lawyers were heavily fined on top of their profound embarrassment. If legal publication houses like CCH and Prentice Hall ever offer a product that has a unique implementation using a chatbot engine, you may wish to experiment with it and evaluate it, but always remember, AI tools are only pattern matching and pattern replication programs. Now, also, Google Scholar has an option to provide case law citations for federal court and also state courts. I do not know if they support all the states. 
This is a far safer artificial intelligence tool to use since it is not a black box that does not reveal its sources. Neither will AI replace hamburger flippers. Another recent Atlantic article discusses the current impracticality of robots replacing minimum wage food preparers at fast food restaurants. This reminds me of an article on robots I read decades ago in Scientific American, where robots were just not able to butter bread, a task that requires incredibly sensitive sensors to duplicate a task most adults can do with ease, although perhaps not very young children. Now this was 30 years ago. Perhaps robots can butter bread now, although I'm a little bit skeptical. Will artificial intelligence terminators take over the world? Now, a foreign affairs article on the use of artificial intelligence in national security applications warns that the risks are profound. Artificial intelligence models could, for example, misidentify people or objects as targets, resulting in unintended death and destruction during conflict. Black box AI models, whose reasoning cannot be adequately understood or explained, might lead military planners to make hazardous decisions. But there is no need to fear, because the Pentagon has also forbidden the use of AI in its nuclear command and control systems, and it has urged other nuclear powers to do the same. Now, what this implies is that the fear of the Terminator movies that our internet-based computer systems will gain consciousness and singularity so that the computers will destroy mankind is totally misplaced. Instead, a zero-comprehension, artificially intelligent program could destroy us all without even realizing what it is doing. Should there even be a nuclear button? Historically, there have been several false positives on both the Russian and American sides where the computer system threw up a false alarm that there was a massive nuclear attack underway, which the operators fortunately ignored, as otherwise we may not be reading this essay today. Even today, there is far more likely possibility of a false alarm than a massive incoming nuclear attack. Maybe we should just rely on our submarines. Which is better, the artificial intelligence chatbots or Wikipedia? My humble opinion, there's no contest. Dr. Wikipedia and Dr. Google together are far more accurate and far more useful than ChatGPT or even Google Bard. Even if your teacher doesn't want you to consult Dr. Wikipedia, you can benefit from consulting with them on the sly. Now, if you read my blogs, which have footnotes, you will discover I use Wikipedia often. I don't like to use Wikipedia as a primary source, but on occasion, I will for unusual or quirky topics. How can you use Wikipedia? If you are a student, your teacher may be rabid about your ignoring Wikipedia. But even if that is true, you can still use Wikipedia to double check facts that you know already, but want to double check. Often when I do this, I will include a footnote referencing the Wikipedia article, even for the most basic factoids. Sometimes I use Wikipedia to find sources for use in my research. I did this for my videos on how Christians survived under the fascist regimes of Europe before and during World War II. Often Wikipedia itself will directly quote a source, and you can copy the quote and the reference. Wikipedia can tell you whether someone is culturally relevant. For example, in my Historical Jesus video, there was a seminar where professors voted with colored beads as to which biblical Jesus quotes were actually said by Jesus. Now, this leading scholar did not have an entry in Wikipedia, which means that he is mostly forgotten today. Some controversial topics such as abortion and LGBTQ issues can have their Wikipedia pages dominated by activists, and relying on their Wikipedia pages can be problematic. Likewise, the AI chatbots can be digesting a lot of conspiracy theory or junk articles on controversial topics, contaminating their Geigo output my doctor has confirmed that the Wikipedia articles on medical topics are surprisingly accurate. Many of them evidently are updated by medical students or doctors. The quality of these specialized technical articles put the chatbot essays to shame. And this is likely true for any technical or scientific topic. What are some of the questions we should ask ourselves about artificial intelligence? Why would I want to see the joy of learning to a stupid black box regurgitates joyless essays? What would I learn if I did that? We should seek wisdom from knowledge to improve ourselves. How can we improve ourselves if we don't do the work of educating ourselves? You should only use artificial intelligence to suggest other sources or to double check your finished essays. But you only perpetuate your ignorance if you permit a stupid robot to replace your thinking. When a business provides valuable services for its customers and clients, should the business fire employees to replace them with unthinking machines simply so it can be more profitable? Does profitability trump service? Does solely concentrating on profitability make the world a better place? Or do you want to stake the public perception of your firm on a stupid robot incapable of true comprehension? 
Should governmental agencies and corporations providing essential services be required to have real live people, hopefully from the community, rather than night shift workers from India handling their customer service? YouTube posts channels for just a few community strikes, and often they flag false positives often generated by bogus complaints by extremists, and I know this from experience. Why not require that YouTube and other media companies to hire real live people you can reach by telephone to respond to these important issues? Should profits trump civic responsibility? Should profits trump dedication to democracy? In particular, should news aggregators like Microsoft and Facebook be required to hire real live people for the important task of selecting news articles for dissemination to the public? How can stupid robots with zero comprehension ever do as good a job as a real live intelligent human being? Do we really want fully automated self-driving cars negotiating heavy traffic? Pilots deactivate the automatic pilot setting for takeoff and landing. What makes cars and trucks and buses so special? Why not have the AI system ring an alarm to allow a driver to take control in congested traffic or when the computer senses unusual conditions or an incoming flood of sensory perceptions? Why not use AI sensors instead to detect if drivers fall asleep so they can wake them up? Now my background is both accounting and programming. In my experience, most programmers are unduly enthusiastic about automation, but there comes a point where further automation hurts rather than helps. As an example, one of the programs I wrote was automating the matching items, prices, and discounts of vendor invoices to purchase order inventory lines, including reading EDI electronic invoices. Now, we were bought out by a Fortune 500 company, and they were just aghast that we did not automatically match these invoices and automatically pay them. My response, and I was speaking as an account rather than as a programmer, was this. What is wrong with having a real life human being scan a matching invoice for $50,000 for five minutes before approving it? Now, androids like Data on Star Trek or the android boy on Steven Spielberg's movie, Artificial Intelligence, will never truly become intelligent. They will never truly become emotional. They can neither be depressed nor elated. They can only mimic intelligence and emotions through pattern matching and pattern replication. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. There's recently been a spate of articles in the Atlanta Magazine, and there's also been several articles in the Foreign Affairs Magazine, and I've always found these magazines to be balanced in their views. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.